Hello everybody. Welcome to Chapter 1 Lecture Presentation entitled A New World. Now if you notice, I put the word new in quotation marks and there is a very specific reason for that. Now of course to the European explorers who first explored this area now known as North and South America, it was entirely new to them. They had no clue that it even existed. However, of course, for the original inhabitants of this new world, it was not new at all. So that phrase, a new world, while true to an extent, is also somewhat misleading. Now throughout this presentation, and throughout all the presentations I'll be giving you, I'll be highlighting a few key focus questions. Pay very close attention to these, as they probably will be reappearing somewhere down the line in the course. So the first one is, what were the major patterns of Native American life in North America before Europeans arrived? It is important to understand that the original inhabitants of the Americas were not a single racial, ethnic, or most importantly, cultural group. They represented a multitude of various languages and types of societies. Now, most are generally believed to have descended from the peoples of Northeast Asia. And there were several waves of immigration, as is currently accepted by the academic community, although there is some controversy here, as new evidence is constantly being discovered. The first wave occurred around 13,000 BCE, the second wave, approximately 8,000 to 6,000 BCE. And then a third and evidently final wave, around 3,000 BCE. How exactly did they get here? Well, there's several theories of the modes of immigration that these peoples took. The most prominent of them is that of the Beringian land bridge. Now, before the end of the last ice age, when sea levels were much lower, the area that is currently covered by the Bering Strait between Siberia and Alaska was exposed, which allowed for people to literally walk across that region and into the Americas and over thousands of years eventually down to the tip of South America. Now, new evidence suggests that some actually also t might have taken some coastal routes using canoes, kayaks, or various things of that nature to actually follow the coastline down that Pacific stretch and down into the Americas and even down into the, uh, South America. There are potentially other routes, as some evidence seems to suggest, but nothing is absolutely conclusive might have some people come from Europe. At the, before the end of the last, last ice age, peoples could have very easily followed the ice flows at, uh, along the northern edge from, like, say, Iceland to Greenland, down into New Finland, and some even argue and speculate that peoples from Africa might have even taken sea routes over to the Americas sometime in the distant past. There is no conclusive evidence of this stuff, and scholars are, of course, hotly debated, but new evidence is emerging every year that seems to suggest that the commonly accepted theory of the Beringian land bridge might not have been the only route or that Asia might not have been the only place that peoples immigrated to the Americas. Now, the most prominent of these early Paleo-Indian cultures prior to the end of the last Ice Age is known as the Clovis culture, which was really widespread uh, among much of North America and is identified by these distinctive spear points that you see here that were used to hunt big game animals such as the mammoth that you see in this image here. Now at the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000 to 8,000 BCE, there was a mass extinction event of these big game animals. Now there's various different theories as to exactly how and why this occurred, including climate change, also, some theories that postulate that perhaps overhunting led to the demise of these big game animals. But their demise led to cultural divergence from that more unified Paleo-Indian Clovis culture as 
specialized economies began to develop in each region of the continent that were designed to respond to the new demands of the changing climate and the various resources available in each of those specific regions. Now, over time, there began to be the development of transcontinental trade routes that, as you see here in this map, stretch all across North America. Now, even though these peoples were very diverse and had their own specialized economies, they certainly had communication with each other and traded all sorts of various goods, including conch shells, which were thought to have been used as some form of currency, copper, galena, which is a form of lead ore, as well as other sorts of goods and trade items. Now, around 2000 BCE, corn was developed in Mexico, and it was adapted for farming along with squash and beans. These three items are known as the Three Sisters, and the farming of these three agricultural items spread all throughout the southwest, the plains, and the eastern woodlands of North America. And these three sisters, as they are known, were very important because the combination of those three agricultural items were very much a part of a well-balanced diet. Those three things together provided just about all the essential nutrients that the human body needs to survive, which is why these three items, squash, beans, and corn, were so very important to the development of agriculture in the Americas in those early years. Now, of course, the development of more settled agriculture and the spread of these three sisters led to more permanent settlements and even some urban cultures in the Americas. Now, around 900 to 1300 CE, which is the Common Era, the Earth went through a period known as the Medieval Warm Period, which led to a much higher rainfall, which equaled plentiful harvests, particularly of those three sisters, which of course led to a population boom, which spurred the spread of urbanization all across the Americas. You had the Hohokam and the Anasazi in the southwest, which are the antecedents of the Hopi, the Zuni, and the Pueblo peoples. You had the Mississippian culture along that Mississippi River Valley. They were also known as the Mound Builders because they were particularly known for building large earthen mounds that were used for ceremonial purposes, as is commonly thought. Also, perhaps for dwelling places as well, but particularly for ceremonial reasons. Now, Cahokia, which was a large city uh, along that Mississippi River Valley, became a major trade and cultural center. And this is an artist's rendering here of what that settlement might have looked like during its heyday based on the most recent archaeological evidence. Now, just prior to the uh, period of colonization, of European colonization, the world went through what is known as the Little Ice Age. Now, this lasted from about 1300 CE all the way up to at least 1850 CE, and some even postulate that it's lasted well into the early 20th century. Now, this led to shifting dynamics among those native cultures and was a very vulnerable period for most. As the temperature cooled and the climate changed, it wasn't so easy in many of those areas to continue the farming and hunting practices that they had become used to. This led to the breakdown of the Hohokam and the Anasazi cities. Uh, some argue that it was over-exploitation of the resources and the environment, coupled with the changing climate that led to some sort of social and political collapse and then dispersal of those populations. 
Of course, there was also increased competition for dwindling resources on the East Coast, which led to heightened conflicts among those native groups as they shifted and shuffled for those dwindling resources. Now, the Mexica, which also known as the Aztecs, migrated into central Mexico at this time and founded the city of Tenochtitlan, which is now modern-day Mexico City. And they became that region's dominant power by the 1460s. Now, this map here shows the various different ways of life that existed pre-colonization in the Americas. You see all the different uh, named tribes, and there were actually much more than this. This is just a small example here. And also the various different uh, lifestyles, agricultural practices, hunting practices that highlighted each one of those particular cultures. And the, the basic takeaway from here is just how diverse those early Americans were. Now, Native American religion was very much related to hunting and farming. They believed in a practice as known as animism, which is the attribution of soul or some sort of spiritual power to plants, inanimate objects, and natural phenomenon. And as you see represented here by this Native American medicine man, the ability to invoke supernatural abilities equaled respect and authority among these Native American Indian tribes. Land and property. They had much different ideas of land and property than the Europeans they would later encounter. Now, generally, leaders assign agricultural plots and, tri and tribes claim specific hunting grounds. Now, they own the right to use the land, but not the land itself. A distinct difference from that European conception of land ownership and something that would lead to much conflict in the future. They believed it was a common resource rather than an economic commodity. And some Indian societies did have rigid social distinctions and hierarchies that mirrored the same sort of social distinctions and hierarchies that existed in European and other world cultures. Generosity was among the most valued qualities in Native American Indian life. And many of their ceremonies were revolved around gift giving and ceremonies of gift exchange as the more powerful people in those social hierarchies kind of held on to and claimed that power by their ability to kind of spread the wealth, if you will, amongst the rest of the population. Gender roles and gender relations were also sharply different from that which existed in Europe. Um, they believed in premarital sex, um, they believed that divorce was possible, and generally, for the most part, most of them uh, held to a what is known as a matrilineal society, where instead of tracing the lineage of peoples through the male line, which would be patrilineal, they actually traced the lineage through the female line. Now, when folks got married, often it was the husbands who moved in with the wives' families instead of the other way around and became part of that family. And sons and daughters, again, traced their lineage through the mother instead of the father. Now, tribal leaders were almost always men, but particularly because of that matrilineal social structure, women did and could help hold positions in politics and religion. Agricultural work and household duties were generally assigned to the women in the societies, while the men's roles focused on hunting and protection. That will be the end of this segment of lecture number one. Um, stay tuned for the next segment. In the meantime, study hard, and we'll see you soon.